It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you. Good day, Speaker. Uh, my first question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of Health responded to questions uh, about COVID-19 uh, by saying that Ontario is not in crisis. She then went on to claim that we had reached a plateau of 1,700 new cases a day. Unfortunately, plateau was the exact same word she used one month ago when we were reporting 987 cases a day. Does the Ford government think they can just make the crisis go away by pretending that it's actually not happening? The member for Eglinton Lawrence and parliamentary assistant. Thank you uh, to the member opposite and thank you, Speaker. Uh, our government from the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic has worked with the Ontario Hospital Association and we've continued to work together to respond to the challenges that this pandemic has presented. And we've been unequivocal that the health and safety of patients, frontline workers and all Ontarians is paramount. We're extremely grateful to our hospital partners and healthcare workers who continue to care for all of the patients requiring care during these unprecedented times. Our government also also recognizes the increasing pressures that the second wave is putting on our hospitals and our health system partners across the province. And that's why we've invested an extra $2.5 billion to support Ontario's hospitals, including the creation of 3,100 new beds in hospitals and alternate care facilities across the province. Now more than ever, it's really Response. critical that all Ontarians continue to follow the public health advice to help stop the spread of the virus so we can make sure we can get the numbers down and flatten the curve. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, well, over the last week, the Premier and his team continue to produce stats that fly in the face of what people actually see every day. This week, parents saw hundreds of new cases in schools while the government dismissed testing results. Seniors and their families learned that another 84 residents died from COVID-19 in long-term care homes this week. Hospitals are cancelling surgeries. Over 200 COVID patients are now in our ICU. Businesses are shutting their doors. And despite this government's claim of a plateau, more and more people are being diagnosed with COVID-19 this week than ever before. Families in Ontario are left asking, if this is not a crisis, then what is? Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Um, our province has always been ready and able to respond to the complex situations that COVID-19 has been presenting us. Everyone in the world is going through a second wave, every jurisdiction, and, and that's happening here as well, of course. The winter season we knew would present more cases here, and that's why we implemented our $2.8 billion Keeping Ontarians Safe plan. This plan has and will continue to make sure that our province's hospitals have the resources necessary to fight this virus. As part of this plan, of course, we've invested over $351 million for more than 2,250 new beds at 57 hospitals and alternate care facilities. And it's critical to point out to the member opposite that since March, since COVID-19 has really been here, a total of 3,131 new hospital Response. beds have been built across the province. But we're, of course, relying on all Ontarians to fo follow the public health measures to make sure that we also work on flattening the curve. Thank you, Speaker. The final supplementary. Thank you. Uh, speaker, for people living in COVID-19 hotspots like Brampton, Scarborough and across the GTA, for students, seniors and essential workers who have to keep going to wor into work so that others can stay home, this is a crisis. And while the Associate Minister would like to compare other jurisdictions, those places are actually getting ready to manage the second wave. This government needs to step up and do the same. Peel's Chief Medical Officer of Health and Brampton's Mayor have joined New Democrats in the call for paid sick days and benefits to protect essential workers in our province. Parents have called for cap size, uh, class sizes to be capped, and public health units are pleading after years of cuts. When will the Premier stop denying the crisis, stop trying to save a buck, and start helping people in our province who desperately need it? Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. Our government has been working for the entire time since, since, since COVID-19 came to Ontario uh, to have a plan and to execute that plan and to make sure that people are getting the resources they need. We've spared no expense to make sure that the people of Ontario and our frontline workers 
are ready and able to combat this disease. And that's why we swiftly introduced the Ontario Action Plan, which provided over $17 billion in funding and resources to combat this outbreak. And included in that plan was $3.3 billion in additional health care investments, including $2.1 billion for new initiatives to respond to COVID-19, and $1.2 billion to continue to meet demand for services and build a connected and sustainable health care system. We've been putting resources out, making sure we have adequate PPE, and providing that to everybody who needs it response? as requested. And I think, Speaker, the response has been fairly well. As you know, uh, the member opposite will know, our numbers are about 100 per 100,000, which is the best in Canada outside of the Atlantic provinces. And so we think we're doing fairly well. Thank you very much. And the next question, member for Tomiskaman Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. For months, frontline staff, public health experts, and even the government's own long-term care commission have called for an action plan to protect seniors living three and four to a ward room in outdated long-term care homes. Yesterday, the Premier said, and I quote, we're considering it. Can the Minister of Long-Term Care tell us how many lives are at stake right now in wardrooms while the Premier considers studying the studies, while he considers whether it's worth spending the money, while he considers whether the government should take action to save these people's lives. Minister of Long-Term Care, respond. Thank, thank you, Speaker. We've been looking at the safety and well-being of residents and staff in long-term care since day one. And that's why we had the original action plan, the $243 million to go towards staffing and improving IPAC control. That's why we put in, with the fall preparedness plan, the $540 million to make sure that the, the staffing and the supports were there. We continue to add resources to our homes to shore them up. This is not a, a simple solution, as some would have it portrayed. This requires many, many understandings of the age of the home, the community, the individual rights of the, of the residents, the individual desires of the residents, their advanced care plans. In fact, the ethics table was engaged very early in wave one to understand this concept. People are, people are at the heart of everything we do, and we will continue to take measures to protect them. And you've heard the Premier say everything is on the table as we consult with our medical and, health and public health experts. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. As we speak, there are outbreaks right now in 43 homes with ward beds and 250 residents have died in the second wave of this pandemic in those homes. And we all know, we all knew that the second wave was coming. We all knew, and the minister also knows and has said it many times in this house, that ward rooms are one of the biggest risks. And we know that in a pandemic, every second counts, every delay, can cost a life. Yet it appears that this government is still concerned about whether to save money on whether it's really worth it to do this, whether it's worth it to take action. Is it really about the money? You knew the ward systems Question. were a problem. Why haven't you taken action? Why are you still considering it? Members, will please take your seats. The response? Mr. Speaker, every resource is being put into these homes, over a billion dollars already, and that's increasing. As I said, $243 million, the $540 million, the $461 million to shore up the, uh, the, uh, the, the staff, it's, it's a very complex issue. And we want to make sure that we are doing everything Order. possible. And that's why the, the concept of transferring residents has been considered since the very beginning. The welfare and well-being of our long-term care residents is at the heart of everything we do. And the Premier has said that no expense will be spared. We are doing everything to put the resident and the staff at the centre. And I'm going to push back 
at the, at the time that you had as a, a supporting in a minority government situation, and you didn't do what you needed to do Response? to rebuild those homes. You didn't do it, and, and you are partly responsible for this. Okay. I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair and not across the floor directly. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Ward rooms are a problem in this province, have been a problem for a long time. Everybody knew it. But COVID-19 is a problem. It's not a problem. It's a crisis right now, and we know it. And those ward rooms aren't something that we talk about that happened 10 years ago. It's happening now. People are dying now. And the Ford government knew absolutely right now that those rooms are unsafe. And yesterday, the Premier said he's still considering on whether they should take emergency measures. When will the Premier, when will the Minister of, of Long-Term Care actually recognize that ward rooms are something that we can't blame on past governments? Ward rooms in COVID are something we have to deal with right now. They have to deal with it right now, spend the money. Why, why don't they? Thank you. Members will please take your seats. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. It's exactly what we are doing, making sure that the safety and the well-being of the residents, whether they're in ward rooms or not in ward rooms, are taken into consideration with the expert medical advice, our public health officials, our, our, our individuals who are related to the, uh, the hospitals that are actively engaged with these homes. Our homes are partnered with the acute care partners to make sure that the best medical and public health uh, evidence and scientific understanding is used to support the residents in our long-term care homes. But residents in long-term care homes are not widgets. They cannot be moved around at the whim of some individual. They have rights sure. and they must be considered. Their wishes must be considered. The, this must be done as we move forward Response. to modernize long-term care, make it a 21st century long-term care system that puts residents at the centre and that spares no expense in this pandemic to make sure they get the care they need. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto, Dan Ford. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Just over two years ago, the Premier unveiled what he called the Made in Ontario Environment Plan. The plan was actually a scheme to make massive cuts. Ontario used to spend $2 billion per year on climate change initiatives, but the government is spending about $20 million this year on climate change and resiliency. A new report today by Environmental Defence shows that Ontario's greenhouse gas emissions have stopped going down and have actually gone up by 10 megatons in Doug Ford's first year in office. Who I'm going to ask the member to refer to the Premier by the name Premier. Okay, you place your question. Who benefits from this government's war on the environment? The uh, parliamentary assistant, the member for Barry Innisfil, to respond. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Well, Ontario has a proud history when it comes to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, over the past two years since we reduced our environment plan, if the member uh, had read it, he would know, note that we already made so many accomplishments which are listed in the plan. For example, we consulted on the first hydrogen strategy, uh, obviously introducing more clean technology uh, into our transit system, which is a large polluter getting uh, more cars uh, off the road, part of our transit strategy. But it's interesting that the member talks about spending when, when you talk about bills that are actually going to get cars off the road, they're going to help the environment, the members of the opposition vote against it. And then in addition to that, when we introduced our environment plan, they had no environment plan. They just sat there. And then after our environment plan, they waited, uh, let me see here, Mr. Speaker, they waited 198 days, six months, and 17 days after we Response. introduced our Made in Terror Environment Plan to introduce a discussion paper or a student survey, I couldn't really figure it out, Speaker, on their uh, green environmental deal. Thank you. And the supplementary question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Speaker. And I, I truly hope the member opposite takes the time to read the report that was released saying our emissions had gone up, because what that actually indicates is that everything they have done has not actually been enough. GHG emissions are continuing to increase under this government. That is the wrong direction. We do not have the time, Speaker, to delay on this. 
Last year, a court found that the Premier broke the law with his very first action in office when he scrapped the cap-and-trade program. He has cancelled climate change combative initiatives that were worth $2 billion a year and replaced them with this flawed plan where the centerpiece, the Ontario Carbon Trust, is nowhere to be seen, Speaker. They keep touting their anti-litter day, but the world is on fire. Order. And the world is on fire, Order. Speaker, and they are picking up litter. Question. He pledged $30 million to fight the federal carbon uh, regime in the courts, which is more than they are spending on fighting climate change itself. When will this Premier stop fighting climate action and start actually fighting climate change, Speaker. Order. Member for Barry Ennisville. Speaker, uh, what the member is saying, it just proves what we've been saying all along. The only plan the, uh, the opposition have for the environment is a tax plan, not an environment plan. And in our made an environment plan, it is a plan. It's not a discussion paper. It's not a survey. And, and more so, it's a constant evolving document, where, which we're actually consulting on even more now to add additional measures. But, but Speaker, let me lay out some of the things that we are investing in. Order. If, the, if the opposition read our, our budget that we just introduced, they would have saw that uh, we have $3.7 billion in green bonds to help finance public transit initiatives, extreme weather resiliency infrastructure, energy Order. efficiency, and conservation projects. And Ontario remains the largest issuer of Canadian green Remember bonds. Remember, for Kingston and the Canada. Islands come to order. The Again, Minister of Labour right come to investments. order. We're not going to tax Ontarians. We're going to help them and give Remember them for Waterloo the come responsibility order. and the tools they need to help protect their environment. The, the member for likes Davenport to criticize Liberty Day, but frankly, what are you going to tell uh, uh, Response? like Youth for Lake Simcoe that it's not enough for them to clean up litter. That's a shame, Mr. Speaker. We should give our next generation hope that they can do something for the environment. House will come to order. Member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you for that, uh, Speaker. Glad you brought them to order. Uh, my, my question, uh, Mr. Speaker, is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. We know that this year in particular has highlighted how important it is to have a place to call home. COVID-19 has shed a light on the pleasures felt in our community housing systems and underscored the urgency to create more affordable housing. With winter well underway in Ontario, can you elaborate on our government's commitment to building more affordable housing throughout Ontario? The parliamentary assistant and member for Milton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the uh, member from Sarnia Lambton for that question and for his hard work on behalf of his constituents. And it is an important question, Mr. Speaker. Years of liberal inaction put pressures on our community and affordable housing system, and I agree. COVID-19 has highlighted the need to create more affordable housing that thousands of Ontarians depend on. We are making direct investments into more affordable housing, reducing the upfront cost Mr. Speaker, pressures on our partners working to build more affordable housing and accelerating the construction of affordable housing units right across our great province. Previous Liberal government's inaction is why we launched our Community Housing Renewal Strategy, which is investing $1.5 billion this year alone to help sustain, repair, and grow community housing to help end homelessness Response. right across our province. Thank you. The supplementary. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the parliamentary assistant for that response. It's great to see a government making these types of investments that will ensure Ontarians have a safe place to call home and supporting our most vulnerable. We know many Ontarians have been struggling financially throughout this crisis, including those living in affordable housing. Will the minister please speak to what ways we are providing direct financial assistance to those in need? Member for Milton. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Sarnia Lambton again. Uh, I am proud to say that Ontario was the first province, Mr. Speaker, to sign on to a portable housing benefit under the National Housing Strategy with the historic $1.4 billion Canada-Ontario housing benefit. Thousands of Ontarians have already received a direct monthly rent assistance payment to help them pay their rent, Mr. Speaker. This is direct money that can be used anywhere across Ontario. That means if an individual's location of employment changes, they can take this benefit with them and not be restricted to live in units only available in certain areas. We expect the number of people who receive this benefit to continue to grow 
Each year, our government will continue to focus on ensuring every Ontarian has a place to call home. Mr. Speaker, thank you. The next question. Member for Davenport. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. In a letter to parents sent in April, the Minister of Education promised that no decisions on schools would be made that do not, and I quote, promote the health, safety, and well-being of our children and students. Since then, the government voted no to capping class sizes at 15, while class sizes grew more crowded. They shot down safety concerns of frontline education workers, and now we know they spent millions on political consultants while public health officials were sidelined. Only now, with over 5,000 cumulative cases in our schools, are we seeing the start of, and I mean very small steps, toward asymptomatic testing of students in some areas. Speaker, through you to the Premier, will the government keep its promise to parents and deliver a comprehensive asymptomatic testing program so we can keep our schools safe? Mr. Education. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to follow the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, who has fully endorsed our plan. We have worked with the Chief Medical Officer of Health and the leadership team of the command table since the spring to develop a plan that has enabled Ontario to reopen schools safely. Putting into context the member opposite's numbers, there is 84.3 per cent of schools in this province that do not have any active cases at all. And this morning, for students, 99.92 per cent of students do not have an active case, and 99.87 per cent of staff do not have an active case. Now, Mr. Speaker, Order. our plan is designed with every layer of protection in place, from more public health nurses to comprehensive masking to more teachers, 2,700, to 1,200 more custodians, to the doubling of public health nurses, everything we can do. Everything we can do to protect our schools, that's what the Premier's commitment is. That's what we will deliver to the people of this province. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I can assure you that no parent or guardian whose child has been exposed to COVID at school is comforted by this minister getting up in this place every single day to say, hey, relax, the kids are all right. You know, tell that. Tell that to the families at Thorncliffe. The fact of the matter is, Speaker, we don't yet know how COVID is being transmitted in schools. These pilot testing projects are going to help, but basing them only in areas with the highest infection rates is really missing the point. We need a clear picture of what the virus looks like in our schools across the province so that we can plan for a safe and orderly return after the holiday, one that doesn't involve major outbreaks. When will we see a plan to ramp up testing, or are you going to, as a government, Wait, uh, continue to wait and see till it's too late yet again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Education. Well, Mr. Speaker, we introduce asymptomatic testing amidst this second wave because we want to make sure that we are able to target and isolate any cases within schools of students or staff or their families that may have COVID but without symptoms. We want to ensure we isolate those cases from schools to mitigate further spread. The point of asymptomatic testing focused on the highest risk communities with high rates of positivities to capture those that may be carrying the virus so that they're not in schools, so order. that they're not no longer within schools. So that's Member for Davenport, launch, come to order. That's why we launch asymptomatic testing in Member the first for place, Lampton, come following order. the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. We've also doubled public health nurses. We've also expanded investments within our schools. Just a week ago, we've provided stabilization. The member for Davenport will come to order. Minister of Education will conclude his response. We provided additional funding to hire more than 2,700 teachers, more than 1,200 custodians. Mr. Speaker, I recognize fully, as I think we all do honestly, the great challenge of COVID-19 as community transmission rises. The government is seized to keep schools and kids safe. We'll do that every step of the way in this province. The next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontarians have paid a high price this year. The pandemic has brought crisis-level financial stress to many households and small businesses. So the last thing they should have to worry about is flooding and damage to their properties. The Ontario Federation of Agriculture is asking for substantive amendments to Schedule 6 of Bill 229. Over 150 organizations, including AMO and the Ontario Big City Mayors, representing people in every corner of this province, are asking the government to remove Schedule 6 from Bill 229. Speaker, we know that flooding is only going to work, get worse 
especially since the government's so-called environment plan is leading to a dramatic increase in climate pollution. So will the Premier Question. listen to the people of Ontario and remove Schedule 6 from Bill 229? The Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Barry Ennis. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. And you know, my uh, I, my heart does go out to the farmers, and certainly the flooding that they had to experience, especially with the impacts of climate change, which is the exact reason this government is making our changes on flood mitigation. And and frankly, it will help our conservation authorities treat flooding very seriously to help those very same farmers you're discussing. If only those conservation authorities spent more than uh, more than or right now they spend less than 20 percent of their budget on flooding. So if they spent a little more on flooding, perhaps that would help. But Speaker, to put in context, in 2017, there was 25 conservation authorities that were spending less than 20 percent of their budget on flood mitigation. In fact, 10 of those 25 conservation authorities were spending even less than that. They were spending closer to 10 percent. So these changes are going to help conservation authorities, help those farmers who are so needed in need of uh, flood mitigation. Thank you. And supplementary. Speaker, with all due respect to the member opposite, the conservation authorities, the big city mayors, AMO, literally organizations representing everybody in this province are asking the government to stop attacking conservation authorities. We know that it costs $43,000 to repair a flooded basement. In my riding, I pay $2.80 to the conservation authority to protect me from flooding. That is a deal. That is a deal that this government is taking away because they're completely undermining the science-based and evidence-based decision-making power of conservation authorities. So I'm asking the government, at a time when people already have so much stress in their lives, why are they increasing Question. by gutting flood protection in this province? Member for Barry Innisfil. Oh, thank you, Speaker. And nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, uh, it's these changes that are not going to be gutting flooding. It's going to actually be increasing flood mitigation. And in fact, in our plan, we, we talk about ways to help work with different sectors to prevent flood mitigation. And I'll read uh, some, some quotes from people who are trying to. There's, a, there's a, an individual who is trying to plant trees around their home, Speaker. And I know the member opposite uh, would appreciate that. But guess what they couldn't do? They couldn't actually do that because the Conservation Authority was getting in the way. There's a municipality in my backyard who couldn't build a drainage pipe to prevent flooding because the Conservation Authority wouldn't allow them the proper permit to prevent flooding. So these are the changes we're making to help mitigate those things. And we're getting terrific support. Actually, the Ontario uh, Farmers Network su uh, supported uh, our changes, and they said the Ontario Farmers Network, a farmer advocate organization that was established in uh, 2002, announced today its formal support for the changes Spons? to the Conservation, uh, uh, Conservation uh, Authorities Act. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And uh, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's Main Street small businesses have been hard hit by the effects of COVID-19. They've been forced to adopt, adapt to a new normal of needing PPE, implementing, implementing safety and social distancing policies, and reaching customers online, and planning further ahead into the future. Will the Minister of Economic Development and Job Creation and Trade outline to this House how our government has stepped up to protect and support our small businesses and help them recover over the longer term? The Parliamentary Assistant, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Sarnia Lambton for the incredible work he does supporting his small businesses. Speaker, we all know that small businesses are the backbone of Ontario's economy and our government will always be in their corner. Small businesses have made extraordinary sacrifices to keep their employees safe, their customers confident and their communities strong. That's why we are providing the Main Street Relief Grant of $1,000 for eligible small businesses in the retail, food and accommodation and other service sectors with less than 10 employees to help offset the costs of PPE. This grant will cover the cost of buying face masks, sanitizer, gloves, sanitizing wipes, and even plexiglass dividers and temperature monitors. Spons. We encourage all small businesses who had to manage unexpected PPE costs to visit ontario.ca forward slash small businesses to apply for the grant. Our government speaker is standing with Main Street businesses, and we remain committed. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. 
Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Parliamentary System for that fulsome and informative answer. Mr. Speaker, I hope small businesses and entrepreneurs across our province take advantage of the PPE grant in the weeks and months to come. Our government understands that buying PPE today is just one challenge. Helping businesses recover longer term is another. Will the minister outline supports we put in place to ensure our Main Street small businesses grow beyond COVID-19? Thank you. Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you, Speaker. For Ontario to recover, our small businesses need to recover and their services and sales must be shifted online. Our $57 million digital Main Street platform will help our small businesses get the job done. Businesses can now access the $2,500 digital Main Street grant to embrace digital marketing. Shop Here, powered by Google, will see skilled students hired to build websites and online stores for businesses. Future Proof Main Street Street will allow digital marketing professionals to help businesses grow. Through our Ontario Together Fund, we've provided $2 million to support 47 small business enterprise centres across Ontario to give small businesses training, financial advice and planning help. We're also providing $131,000 for Chartered Accountants of Canada to develop an online financial literacy tool to help businesses recover and manage financial risks. These new Thank you very much. Next question, the member for London North Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This Conservative government has spent weeks defending their scheme to give Charles McVitie, Ontario's most vicious opponent of gay and trans rights, the right to grant university degrees at his Canada Christian College. Yesterday, Conservative MPPs did remove a section from Bill 213, but it was a section on a code of conduct for marriage officiants, which was removed after groups like Campaign Life Coalition complained it would promote same-sex marriage. Why did the government happily amend the bill for these groups, but ignore the thousands of people who don't want Charles McVitie handing out university degrees? Members will take their seat. The parliamentary assistant, member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know that enabling legislation for private faith-based institutions has existed under governments of all stripes, and we have these procedural safeguards going to the Post-Secondary Education Quality Assessment Board. We have that, and these, these matter, Mr. Speaker, these safeguards. Mr. Speaker, I think it's important to remind the member of the importance of PCAB and some measures built in. For example, in nomenclature change, organizational review, we talk the board reviews mission statements, administra administration capacity, financial stability, student protections. Mr. Speaker, these are available publicly for all Ontarians to see. This process has been integral in ensuring a world-class education system for years, and it will be integral going forward, and this government will Order. stand by procedural fairness and follow the process. Thank Order. you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. My question is back to the Premier. The member spoke about uh, processes, but one of the processes is the committee process, and that's to listen to the public, to listen to Ontarians. And I'd like to say that the Human Rights Code is integral here in Ontario. The government can no longer, no longer credibly claim this is about a process. They were happy to amend the bill, but somehow they can't find it within themselves to do the same thing for the thousands of Ontarians who said that granting McVitie more power and influence would be harmful and dangerous. Speaker, there is still time for them to do what is right. The thing this legislature asked them to do, admit they were wrong, and stop their plans to make Charles McVitie a university president. The response, parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we are going to follow the PCAB process. And I find this very confusing, the member opposite. And I'll quote, Mr. Speaker, because it seems to me that some members on the other side do understand and value the PCAB process. I'm going to quote from the member from Hanca um, Hamilton West Ancaster Dundas. As an institution within my constituency with vibrant undergraduate programs, she goes on to say, I urge a speedy consent be given to the PCAB recommendation regarding a faith-based institution in her writings need for a timely process. Mr. Speaker, on the one hand, members on that side support the PCAP process, Order. and then on the other hand, they want government and politicians to intervene. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we will all—
The member for Hamilton Mountain come to order. The member for Waterloo come to order. The parliamentary assistant will conclude his response. They don't want to listen to the words of their own members because on this side of the House we will always stand by the procedural fairness and stick by the PCAP process. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Windsor West will come to order. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Long-Term Care. Earlier this week, we learned that the Independent Long-Term Care Commission the government appointed is still waiting for the minister to release key documents outlining the government's decision-making process in its response to COVID-19 in Ontario's long-term care homes. The commission says that the continual delay in releasing requested documents is impeding its work. She would know that one of those commissioners, commissioners is Jack Kitts, who was head of the Ottawa Hospital. On Tuesday, uh, on Tuesday, the minister was quoted as saying she wants to get to the bottom of this. It certainly doesn't feel that way. And we know from the Auditor General's report that the documents exist. So, Speaker, through you, can the minister commit to no further delay in getting the documents to the government's Question. commission that they need to do their work? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. You know, we've committed to this since the very beginning. In fact, when we struck the commission, uh, the point was to understand uh, any early guidance they might be able to provide, as well as to understand what transpired with the spread of COVID-19 uh, in our long-term care homes. So this has been our commitments since the very beginning, to be transparent, to provide the documents that the, uh, that the commission requests. And, and we've, gave, we've given the commission greater uh, expansion in terms of reference. Uh, and, and they have the ability to uh, uh, ask for those documents and to receive those documents. And that's what we're in the process of doing. We've been giving documents and sharing them with the Auditor General, with the uh, patient ombudsman. Uh, we are continuing to provide the necessary information uh, to our, our ability while we deal with the, the, the problems in our long-term care homes. So we're committed to, to doing this. We will continue to work with the, the commissioners and the commission. Uh, we understand how important the work that they're doing is, and uh, Ontarians have... Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, the minister's right. Ontarians have questions, and the commission is asking them on their behalf. And it certainly doesn't feel like the minister wants to get to the bottom of this, and it just feels like further delays. You know, we remembered last winter when we delayed this government delayed more than a month from preventing workers from working more than one home or raising their wages like other provinces did or how we waited months to get essential caregivers back into the home or how we wait how long-term care homes are still waiting for a plan to get people out of four-bed wardrooms how long it took to get the armed forces into ontario's long-term care homes that needed it and i've been asking a question for three days and it looks like that one's going to get delayed too and I know what the outcome of that should be. So I know what the outcome right now should be with your own commission, Minister. Will you commit today to no further delay in getting them the thousands of relevant documents that they need? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. We've worked decisively and actively during all of this. This has been an integrated effort with Public Health Ontario, with medical experts, uh, taking the advice of our public health officials uh, across ministries, across governments. Uh, this is a process that, uh, although I would like it to be immediate, um, it is not, and it takes time to coordinate. What we do in one area affects another. And we've been, uh, with our fall action plan, with the action plan earlier in April, all of these entities have been involved in this process of, of creating the safety and the well-being of our residents in long-term care. This is a global pandemic. This has uh, never been seen before uh, in our lives. And so there are many, many good people working on this. The $461 million Response. to improve the pay for our, our long-term care workers, who are the heroes at the front lines of this. These measures are being worked on constantly and have been ever since the beginning, and will continue to do that. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Sarnia Lampton. <coughs> well, thank you, uh, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Children and Women's Issue. Uh, Speaker, as we know in this House, the rights of a child and youth and child welfare system and the youth justice system are found in the Child, Youth and Family Services Act. And just like most legislation, it's hard to comprehend all the legalese and make sense of what is written.
That is unfair to the kids this legislation impacts because they deserve to know and understand their rights. Speaker, it's also important that parents and caregivers can access and read this same legislation in plain language so that they're able to provide the best care possible. They need to be able to get this information in an easy location that is free and accessible. Speaker, can the minister uh, assure this House and my constituents of Sarnia Lambton that children and youth, as well as their parents and caregivers across this great province, will be able to learn about their rights in an accessible and simplified format? Associate Minister for Children and Women's Issues. Karen, thank you to the member from Sarnia Lambton for that question. And I commend him for introducing a PMB this afternoon that will further support children in care. Speaker, the member is absolutely right. It is incredibly important that all children and youth, especially those impacted by the Child, Youth and Family Services Act, know their rights. They need to know where to go if they have questions or concerns, and they need to be able to find this information in an accessible place. As part of the work to redesign Ontario's child welfare system, our government created the Children and Young Persons Rights Resource. It is a web page that uses youth-friendly language to help children and young people understand their rights under the CYFSA and use their voices. The key to this resource is it is written in youth-friendly language and easy to understand. You don't need to be a lawyer to understand it. It also provides information on where a child or youth can go to seek help, such as the ombudsman or mental health supports. Speaker, we want to ensure that all children and youth are able to not just hear, but to know their rights and to learn about them in a way that is easy to understand. And I'm proud to Response. continue this work to help these young people. Thank you. Well Supplementary. <clears throat> well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. Speaker, the, men the Minister mentioned child welfare redesign. This is an important undertaking, and children and youth of an, in Ontario have not been supported as they should have been for years. One area of importance that I was pleased to see from the minister was a quality standards framework, something that was recommended in the chief coroner's expert panel report of 2018 and developed by youth with lived experience in residential care from the report in 2017. However, similar to the uh, CYFSA, the quality standards framework is long and can be difficult to read. Children and youth deserve to know what they can and should expect in terms of care from foster parents, from children and age societies, and what kind of services they are able to get that respond to their culture and their identity. Speaker, can the minister please commit to this House that she will listen, work with advocates and those with lived experience Question. so that they know the quality of care they should be receiving? Thank you. Good minister to reply. Speaker, and thanks again to the member for the question. Speaker, every single child should have the same high quality and standards of care in the province, whether you are in the child welfare system or not. These services should be available no matter your race, religion, sexual identity, or where you live. I can say confidently that we are working to create a youth-friendly version of the quality standards framework, putting it in plain language so that everyone can better understand what type of care is expected. Speaker, the framework was developed in consultation with district school boards, youth with lived experience, Indigenous and 2S LGBTQ partners, mental health agencies, and more. And we will continue to work with them to ensure that the youth-friendly version going forward will be beneficial to the children and youth that are impacted. I'm also proud to say that we are working with our sector partners to be proposing regulatory Response. and legislative amendments in the future. We want to ensure we are getting the best advice as this work is being phased in over the next two to three years. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiewetnong. Good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. It isn't right in a rich uh, province like Ontario, all communities don't have clean drinking water. The Skanaga <clears throat> First Nation continues to have no drinking water. Uh, they have been evacuated for 45 days. Mr. Speaker, we are not animals. We are not goats. We are people just like you. <clears throat> we should be able to turn on our taps and simply have a drink of water. If Ontario wants to develop the North, and if you want our nations to work with you, honor treaty number nine. Bring the people clean water. Why is Ontario continuing to ignore the crisis? Thank you. The government house leader to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, as always, I think uh, all of us appreciate uh, uh, the 
the comments of the member opposite, uh, who uh, obviously has uh, unique circumstances across uh, his uh, his writing. Uh, the Minister of uh, Indigenous Affairs and uh, as well as the Minister of Environment uh, earlier did express uh, uh, disappointment that the federal government had announced that it was not going to be meeting the, the targets it set uh, with respect to uh, water uh, in, uh, in our, in our uh, uh, First Nations communities. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to uh, uh, press the federal government to uh, ensure that they, they meet that commitment and, of course, we'll continue to uh, uh, work cooperatively with our First Nations partners. Uh, the member is absolutely correct. This is something that uh, we all need to work uh, very, very hard on, and he has uh, certainly has uh, my word and the word of this government that uh, we will continue to press the federal government to meet their uh, commitments. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Uh, it's not uh, fair to play jurisdictional ping-pong on the lives and the health of people in the, in the north. After the Premier, it isn't right, uh, it is, uh, Speaker, it's really important to hear these messages from young people of Niskanaga. They say, and I quote, I don't want to go through what my grandpa has been through for 25 years. Go live in Niskanaga and see how it feels getting no clean water. You're welcome to stay in my house and see, end quote. Speaker, B. Dabin is nine, nine years old, and she has no faith in government to help. She said, I would be surprised if they fixed the water properly. Will Ontario do what's right and make sure B. Dabin grows up with access to clean drinking water? Thank you. Governor House Leader again to reply. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, uh, the, the member is, is, is correct. I don't think anybody in the, uh, uh, on either side of the House is going to argue uh, with the fact that uh, uh, First Nations community across, this, uh, across Canada, not just across Ontario, uh, have a number of, uh, of challenges that governments uh, uh, at all levels need to work uh, cooperatively to, to solve, resolve, uh, and it is long overdue that we, we do that. Uh, the member is correct. Uh, the federal government made a commitment in working with the provinces and territories. Uh, part of that commitment, uh, dating back to 2015, that it would uh, uh, solve the, uh, the water crisis on uh, many of our First Nations reserves. They've recently announced that uh, uh, they would not uh, be able to honour that, uh, that commitment. The Ministry of, uh, of Environment and the Minister of Environment here did signal uh, his intention uh, to uh, continue to work uh, very aggressively and cooperatively with the federal government and with the First Nations uh, communities uh, to, to take all of uh, the measures that the Ontario government could do uh, to assist the federal government should they uh, be able to honour this commitment. I do agree with the member and we will continue to press the federal government on his behalf. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question will be addressed to the Premier. Conservation Ontario, which represents the 36 conservation authorities, had the following to say about Schedule 6 of Bill 229, and I quote, We are asking the government to withdraw Schedule 6 because these are not administrative budget-related amendments, but rather are significant amendments impacting public policy and for which adequate and specific public consultation has not occurred. These proposed amendments are deserving of the sober second thought provided through specific consultation and then debate in the legislature." End quote. Can the minister explain why these changes have been included in the omnibus budget bill instead of being proposed in a separate bill so that they could receive the careful consideration, debate, Question. and public consultation that they deserve? The Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Barry Innisfeld. Has to thank, you, thank you, Speaker. And many Ontarians don't have time to wait for flood protection and flood mitigation, which is why these changes are so important. And when it comes to con uh, consulting with all 36 conservation authorities, uh, they had been consulted. They had different one-on-ones with, uh, with members from the Ministry of Environment. And of course, we had roundtables throughout the province, as well as different discussion papers that were posted online. And many of the changes that are in the legislation the members are referring to was actually asked for by conservation authorities, uh, because it's not enough to, uh, we have to, it's not enough to just to make, uh, make changes later on. We have to think about changes now to help people with flooding and to help constituents who've written into the Ministry of Environment saying that, you know, for example, a property owner was trying to plant 500 trees around his property, couldn't get it done. You had someone who was trying to restore their shoreline to prevent from flooding, couldn't get it done. And so it was this, uh, this government that's making the changes so those individuals can Fonts. get it done, prevent flooding, and help their surrounding environment. 
And a supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, according to the Conservation Ontario website, only around 8% of the funding for conservation authorities typically comes from provincial funding sources. In the case of the Hamilton Conservation Authority, the board chair, Lloyd Ferguson, who I will note is also a city councillor, said that provincial contributions only amount to 2% of their revenues. Municipalities, on the other hand, generally contribute over 50% of the funding, while most of the remaining amounts is self-generated. Despite this, there is still a lot of pushback from both municipalities and conservation authorities regarding the proposed change in Bill 229. Given that the province has invested so little in the work of conservation authority, can the minister explain why the government should move forward with such controversial changes when they are opposed by the very people Question. who actually are investing significantly in the work of the conservation authorities? Member for Barry Thank you, Speaker. And uh, if, if she's uh, talking to conservation authorities, perhaps she can talk to the conservation authority that told her leader, uh, Del Duca, not to override their conservation authority to, pl uh, to plan a pool in his backyard. Uh, so if they really care about the environment, they should speak to their own leader. But what's more, if you care about conservation authorities um, helping prevent flooding, perhaps the member could also know uh, that she should encourage uh, uh, many more conservation to spend more Order. on flood mitigation. For example, as I mentioned, in 2017, there were 25 conservation authorities that were spending less than 20 percent of their budget on flood mitigation, and then 10 of those 25 conservation authorities were spending even less than that, uh, closer to about 10 percent. Uh, so again, uh, Mr. Speaker, we're focused on, again, helping uh, Ontarians uh, with flood mitigation, making sure we protect Response. our land, water and air, and of course, make sure that we're preserving uh, any, any damage on the environment when it comes to natural hazards. Thank you. Okay. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Today is the International Day for People with Disabilities, and 60 disability organizations sent the Premier a letter today, and my question is for him. In September, the government's bioethics table for the COVID-19 response recommended which patients should be refused critical medical care if overwhelmed hospitals ration it, but to date, the government is keeping those recommendations secret. People with disabilities have a right to know what the government is going to be thinking of doing in this life and death area. We hope that triage never becomes necessary, but Ontario has to be prepared. Will the Premier keep his promise to be transparent to people with disabilities, publicize the COVID-19 plans with critical triage protocol, and do what is the proper thing, make these bioethics table recommendations public? Member for Eglinton Lawrence to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Mr. Speaker, the health and well-being of Ontarians is our government's top priority. In response to COVID-19, we've taken action to build more capacity in our health care system, effectively manage surges and future waves of COVID-19. And that's why we invested an additional $2.5 billion, or an increase of 13 per cent from last year, to support our hospitals throughout the pandemic and build capacity, including 3,100 new beds across health facilities. It's critical that I remind the member opposite that at the request of health system stakeholders, Ontario Health and the Bioethics Table, of the provincial command structure uh, drafted a clinical triage protocol for a major surge in COVID pandemic for a potential worst case scenario due to the spread of COVID-19. To be clear, this was a draft developed for engagement and consultation and should not be used. We've also asked our bioethics table to ensure that concerns and perspectives of Once. Indigenous people, Black and racialized communities, persons with disabilities and others who may be disproportionately affected by critical care triage due to systemic discrimination are meaningfully considered and referred Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question, member for Windsor West. Back to the Premier. People with disabilities are not a priority for this Conservative government. They struggled before the pandemic, and it's even worse now. We're in a global crisis, and yet this Conservative government provided zero automatic income support, not even a meagre increase to ODSP or OW. The supportive housing crisis is out of control. The waitlist is well over 20 years long. April's daughter has developmental disabilities and has lived in a psychiatric hospital ward for two years. She is one of five individuals that I am personally aware of across the province, and I'm sure there's many more. 
There are people who have been promised supportive housing. Some even have a spot held in a home, but we're told by this Conservative government that there's no funding for them, so they languish in the hospital with no quality of life. This Conservative government holds the solution and the funding in their hands, but refuse to make this right. Will the Premier make this a priority today and put up the funding needed to help April's daughter and the other families in crisis? The Associate Minister for Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, the member, for your question. Our government took immediate action to protect our province's most vulnerable people and frontline staff who care for them in residential settings. Through the COVID-19 Action Plan for Vulnerable People, we implemented measures that will help to stop COVID-19 at the door of these facilities through measures like enhanced screening and use of PPE and manage outbreaks where they do happen, which includes enhanced testing and contact tracing. This plan builds on our previous investments, including up to $40 million to support organizations that provide residential services like our developmental services agencies. As well, the 2020 budget includes an investment of $30 million over the next two years to support both residential and non-residential service providers in the social services sector as they continue Order. infection prevention and control measures. I ask the member, will you support our budget and support the vulnerable Response. people and frontline workers working hard in developmental services in Ontario? Next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier. Last week, I said that the government forcing shoppers into the same place, like a few big box stores, for all of their shopping needs is a great way to maximize the spread of an airborne virus like COVID-19. Recently, 50 retailers sent a letter to the Premier and Minister of Health reiterating my position that having customers limited to a few stores may increase the rate of spread. The government claims to rely on science. So I ask, what does the science say? about customers overcrowding and all gathering in a few stores rather than being spread out among all retailers in terms of increasing the rate of spread of COVID-19. The response, Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Uh, speaker, uh, in consultation with the Chief Medical Officer of Health and health experts, the province has moved Toronto and Peel Region to lockdown and some regions to new restriction levels in keeping Ontario open and a safe and open framework. Now, Speaker, those necessary measures are being taken to limit community transmission of COVID-19 in order to keep schools open, safeguard our health system capacity, and protect those most vulnerable. But what those businesses should be doing and what you should be telling your constituents that there is $600 million that is available to them to assist in 100% of their property taxes during this period, 100% of their energy costs during this period. There's a $1,000 Main Street recovery grant that they can apply for. There's a $57 million digital Main Street grant they can apply for. And I'll address that. Thank you, and supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, in that same letter from the 50 retailers to the Premier and the Minister of Health, they asked on behalf of all retailers that the government allow them to reopen with reduced capacity rules. Just yesterday, the Premier's favourite tabloid, the Toronto Sun, published an article with data from the province that claimed that the government could only identify 106 cases linked to retail shopping. That's 0.1% of 116,000 COVID cases to date, and that includes employees. Fitness only accounted for 206 cases. Restaurants? only 227 cases. So what scientific data did the government use or rely on in deciding that retail stores, restaurants, and fitness centers should be closed to reduce the spread? Or did the government just make it up? Huh. Minister, to reply. Thank you, Speaker. The Chief Medical Officer of Health and health experts continue to provide advice to our government using a wide range of criteria, and, Speaker, we continue to listen to them. But again, I urge the member to talk to these businesses and let them know that there is $600 million available. And, Speaker, there are very few who have applied for this, for this funding so far. We need them to know that there's $57 million. They can take their business offline and, uh, and go online. They have a $2,500 grant that will assist them Response. to put their business online and have a worldwide audience. Speaker, these are the kind of supplements that our government is providing these businesses in their time of need. 
The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier admitted once again that his plan that puts big box stores first and small Main Street shops last was, quote, unfair. But then he tried to blame the province's top doctors for giving him the advice. We just heard it again. Speaker, we know from the AG's report that despite what the Premier and the Conservatives say, the CMO has never been driving the province's pandemic response. If he's looking for someone to blame, the Premier needs to look in the mirror. This week, businesses from across the province wrote to the Premier calling on him to fix this unfair plan and stop making things worse for everyone not named Walmart or Costco. They're, they're going to be fine. Main Street, not so much. Actually, to date, as of August, in the province of Ontario, we've already lost 13,500 businesses. Wow. CFIB has said that one in seven businesses are at risk. In KW and Main Street, we've already lost 25 businesses. They're gone. Question. Mr. Speaker, we know what businesses need. They told us they need and they deserve direct financial support. What is this government waiting for? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Growth. Well, Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to reiterate the exact direct government support. As I, started, as I stated a moment ago, Order. $600 million, up from $300 million, is available. Every one of those businesses in the Toronto and Peel region in the lockdown can have their entire energy bill paid for every day that they're in lockdown. They can have all of their taxes, property taxes, paid for in that lockdown. They can apply online for a $1,000 PPE grant. There's 60,000 of them available. We've only heard from 1,350 of those businesses so far. There's 60,000 available. There is a $57 million uh, program available to help them go online. There is a rent subsidy that pays for a tremendous percentage of Response. their rent. There is a wage subsidy that pays for a tremendous amount of their wages. We need these businesses to go online, register, and get the money flowing. It's there. It's been committed to them. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period. The government house leader has informed me that he has a point of order he wishes to raise. Thank you. Uh, government house uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, speaker, in accordance with Standing Order uh, 59, I wish to outline the uh, uh, status of business for, uh, for next week. Uh, on Monday afternoon, we will uh, be uh, debating Bill 229, uh, which is an act of budget measures. Uh, on uh, Tuesday, Bill 229. On Wednesday and on Thursday, Mr. Speaker, uh, we will be having the opportunity to debate uh, two motions which the government will soon be bringing forward, which I'm sure the honourable members across the way will be very excited to see. Uh, on uh, Monday, we will be dealing with, uh, with private members' business, uh, ballot item number 44, standing in the name of the honourable member from Cambridge. On Tuesday, ballot item number 45, uh, the member for Ottawa South. Um, on Wednesday, ballot item number 46, in the name of the member for Toronto Centre, and on Thursday, ballot item number 47, uh, standing in the name of the member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. We now have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on the motion for third reading of Bill 222, an act to amend various acts in respect of transportation-related matters. On December 2nd, 2020, Ms. Mulroney moved third reading of Bill 222, Mr. Calandra has moved that the question now be put. The bells will ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes on Mr. Calandra's motion that the question now be put. I'll ask the clerks to prepare the lobbies.